Obviously, this is a huge honor for me to be able to moderate tonight's discussion of the original creators. Uh, this experience, this is what it's all about for us. You know, we the idea of projecting a movie and having a live audience, when we were backstage, you could hear the audience responding. It was just fantastic. Um, I'm going to throw it around and let everyone talk, obviously. Uh, it's really important to hear what people felt then and now. But one of the things I want to start with is that when you have a film like this that is so monumental in its impact, you know, its history, one tends to think, oh, well, it was always that way. It was this huge project in Hollywood. It was begun with all this auspicious talent, and Paramount knew what they had. When in reality, uh, and I want to throw this to Francis, in, in reality, uh, Paramount bought The Godfather. They'd had a horrible experience, a huge loser, called The Brotherhood, starring Kirk Douglas a few years before, and they didn't believe that mafia movies were going to work. So, they literally had the idea that this would be a quickie, low-budget movie that they could put out uh, to take advantage of the bestseller nature of The Godfather, but they didn't want to make a commitment. So when they first started to uh, adapt it, they wanted to make it a contemporary film set in the 70s. And they did a script and that didn't work. And then uh, they finally started to say, well, what can we do to make this cheap and fast? In fact, the way it was described is cheap, dirty, and quick. And they were, this is the thing that's interesting, we're looking at this august group of people, but Francis Coppola was an independent filmmaker who had made The Rain People, which was a low-budget movie. Uh, Al Ruddy and uh, Ray Fredrickson had made a film called uh, Little Foss of Doug Halsey, which their claim to fame was they came in under budget and, and under a million bucks, and that's why Paramount chose them. And I think that this is important to understand that sometimes, you know, all the time, Hollywood's looking at, they're usually wrong. In this instance, thank God they were. But I want to throw it to Francis, because he, in, in his, he's got a fantastic piece about his notebook. In his notebook, he talked about one day in 1969 where three things happened in his life that changed it. Francis. Well, well, it's a true story. We were living in San Francisco, and it was a Sunday, and uh, we had looked at the New York Times, and I looked at the book section, and we noticed an ad that seemed intriguing. We had this puppeteer string it was called The Godfather by Mara Buzo. I had never heard of uh, it or, or of the author. And I was attracted to it because I thought it was a kind of foreign author, uh, intellectual book about power. And just as I was you know, thinking, I wonder what that is, uh, there was a knock on the door and it was Al Ruddy, uh, whom I, I don't, maybe I had met him, and, and Gray Fredrickson, and they were in San Francisco doing a little false and big halsey, which was a San Francisco location picture. And then you heard it, I had moved to San Francisco and were just dropping by. They weren't associated with um, The Godfather. <clears throat> and then the phone rang while they were there. And of all people, it was Marlon Brando uh, calling me uh, to turn down the script, the conversation, which I had submitted to him, and I had never spoken or met Marlon Brando, and I was, you know, as a, any drama student from the from the 50s, it was, you know, Marlon Brando, Evia Kazan, and Tennessee Williams were the, the trio of most uh, august people there could be. So on that one day, and he was very nice, Marlon turned me, turned me down, but uh, they called me personally to tell me that, and I've often thought how odd that is that on that one day, um, Gray and Al Ruddy, uh, who were going to be the producers of The Godfather, the book itself had really struck my eye, and Marlon Brando, who was eventually to appear in it, 
uh, all kind of came together on uh, what that. I, I tell that story, and I always say, but it's really true. It really <laughs> happened on that one day. So, so it was pretty remarkable. And Francis, tell us what you thought when you finally read the book. I was disappointed in the book when I first read it. Nothing like that. It was very long. I don't know if any of you have read the book. Yeah. But a very, uh, if you remember, much of the book, maybe a th third sure. or a quarter yeah. of it, was about, about Lucy Mancini's anatomy. <laughs> you, you haven't read the book. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I thought the book was a little bit of a, of a, on the first reading, I thought it was a little little bit of a pot, pot boiler. May I say, just since I'm here with all these, uh, many of the folks here I haven't seen recently, but I'd like to just uh, thank those who, who, who aren't here anymore. Johnny Casal. <laughs> Alan McCleary, who played Salazzo. who was the man in the beginning, I believe, in America, who got the part in the open call, and uh, Marlon Brando. And, um, I'm sure there are a couple of others, uh, and certainly in part two. Pardon? Michael Gazzo! Oh, well, Michael Gazzo. Michael uh, oh, uh, excuse me, not Michael Gazzo. He's in part two. I didn't get the... Uh, Richard Richard Castellano. Uh, I found him. But also let me very briefly thank some people who were very importantly involved in this movie, starting on the production end, uh, certainly Al Reddy and, and uh, Gray Fredrickson, Bob Evans, Bob Evans, a very controversial figure, a man, a sort of an extraordinary man, not without talent, I must say. Uh, made my life miserable, but he, uh, he put a lot into The Godfather, and of course, the great Gordon Willis, who photographed him. And, uh, and Dean Tavalaris, the production designer. Ivan Young Johnson, who did the costumes, and Nino Rota, who wrote the music. Many other people that I wanted to just mention. Those, those folks uh, who were so important to do with this film. I think that um, one of the things that we should start with, uh, you know, this august group here all went on to other work. Mm -hmm. This is the beginnings of their careers. And if you think about it, it was an extraordinary coming together of talent, uh, acting talent. And of course, you know, Fred Roos, who was your partner for a long time and casting director. Definitely, he should be mentioned with those others I just mentioned, who is uh, Fred Roos, who was the director of casting. Yeah. But I, think that, I think that this is an opportunity to have everybody here on stage will begin by just talking about how this project came to them. Now, Bob, <laughs> we'll wait for him because uh, he's in two. But let's. <laughs> He was, he was waiting in the wings. He uh, auditioned for the first one. Well, that's the point we're going to make. I, uh, Francis, I think in this instance, we're going to let each of these people talk about where they've got. And then you, if you want to chime in about because there's two factors here. There's the actor, and in this instance, it's the beginning of their career. So no one is really knocking at the door. Remember that most waiters and bartenders and waitresses that you go to see in New York, if you go into a place and you say, what do you do? They say, I'm an actor. They say, well, how do you pay your rent? Well, I'm paying my rent right now. You know, it's a tough time when you start in that business. And, um, you know, in, in this instance, when the phone call came or Francis came up and said whatever, um, it, it's a big moment. So let them talk and then, Francis, if you want to say what it was about them that drew you to it. Um, so I, I want to start with Bob and Jimmy because they had worked with you before. The rain, they were both in the rain people, so they had an antecedent. Jimmy, let's start with you, because you go, you go back before that. You guys went to Hofstra together, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can tell about my speech, by the way. 
But I knew France when I was 23, 24. I lived in the back of my house. What I charge you, about 25 cents, 30 cents. <laughs> we didn't go to Hofstra at the same time, and he Not wasn't together. And he wasn't involved in the, in the, in the drama department at Hofstra, which was why I was there. <laughs> no, I wasn't involved at Hofstra at all, actually. You were, you were there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I, uh, I got out of there. But uh, we, 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 did the, we, we, we did the main people. And uh, the thing that you said that impressed me the most is, and I said it this afternoon, but I don't think ever, and thanks to this guy right here, solely, has there ever been, for me, a gathering of actors like the likes of these. This is going to be a crew that reached the top in every single one of their departments. So um, Francis, you know, somehow in his young little mind <laughs> just knew, uh, you know, who, uh, who had it and who didn't, and he knew where every character was at every second, and, uh, and most importantly, I, I had a, a great time. <laughs> he was great. And, uh, and Alan, unfortunately, I didn't get to work with the other Bobby D down there, but um, uh, I think I, I got together with him because of the rain people, and uh, it, was, it was just great. And the big thing is, I think, because he was a Mediterranean Italian, I'm not a Brooklyn Italian. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Duvall? Let's talk a little bit about let's talk a little bit about your experience on the Rain Man and, and coming to this. When did the Rain Man? Well, I was in the Rain People, but uh, I was only in the Rain People because somebody else got fired. <laughs> remember, remember that you put him out, and uh, I came in. And it was uh, it was it was great to be there, you know. With Jimmy and everybody in the Midwest, and uh, and after that, uh, George Lucas was there, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. And uh, I got to, I, I never got to know Francis that much because he was really very busy, and uh, he didn't say much to me. But it was it was great being there. And then uh, when they when we were going to do the Godfather, uh, it was a kind of a makeshift uh, uh, kind of audition we all had up in San Francisco, right? But you know what? I want to. Thank Francis for giving me the part, and thank Bobby for having tonight. This tonight, this is wonderful. I, you know, I don't know what else to say. Except, uh, uh, we had we had a great time working together in The Godfather, and uh, and Brando particularly liked Jimmy Kahn because Jimmy could be pretty funny. <laughs> and uh, when Jimmy would tell a joke, it would take Brando like three seconds to get it. Then he goes. <laughs> <laughs> Good experience, and uh, you know, here we all are, and uh, many years later, many years later. But I want to thank Francis for giving me the part. It was kind of a catalyst to my career, you know. Between him and Horton Foote, you know, there were two my people that really helped my career. So. Uh, Let's talk about Connie, and uh, let me just one question. Did you... Yeah, she's come up here. Your brother is doing this film. Did you know about the part and say, hey, I want that, or did he come to you and say, hey, I got something for you? Uh, I'll tell the truth. <laughs> I, I asked for an audition, and I was in that same place that you were in that Stairs place. You were there. You were there. We were all sitting there. I asked for an audition. It was uh, tough for me, and it was tougher for my brother. Honestly, we talked about this, didn't we, Bob, this morning? That you know, during that first Godfather, for a few weeks, your job as the director was up for grabs, and the last thing he needed was a sister who couldn't figure out what a mark was. You know, and I, 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 I think one of my first scenes, I walked into the camera and knocked it down. <laughs> it was Marlon Brando who said, it's okay. But I mean, I have to tell you, it wasn't easy, and, and I, it, you, didn't, you didn't need me to, to be there, but you were very kind, and thank you. 
I didn't, at, at first I didn't see uh, Tally as Connie because I felt from my interpretation that Connie was a kind of homely Italian daughter that only got to marry a good looking guy like the husband she did because she was, you know, you know she was a, a wealthy and powerful girl. To me, any, to me, I thought Tally was so beautiful that it, anyone would want to marry her, much less that she's the daughter. <laughs> I, I thought she was wrong for the part. I thought she should be the girl who was sort of homely. Uh, and, and, and you can see the logic of that. And I must say that it was uh, Bob Evans who championed her. Uh, and, uh, and at a time, you know, the cast was always up in the air and there was a lot of controversy, which Al will tell you about. Uh, and, and at one point, you know, at one point I went to uh, England to, uh, even regarding uh, Marlon Brando, but I did go to, I was sent to England to, um, to meet Marlon Brando, and I did, he was making a picture there, and he was very gracious, uh, but when I got back, I just called in a phone booth my, my uh, secretary, and the, the, she said, oh, don't, so important, I had a message to call her, and she said, very important, don't quit, let them fire you, <laughs> and I knew immediately what that meant, to Meant that if they fought, and I didn't have any money. I had a, a, two kids and one on the way, and I was totally broke. And I knew that if they fired me, then they'd have to pay me. But if I quit, they wouldn't. So I thought it was all over. And um, so I called the studio, and they, um, I, thinking, you know, why should I even come in if you're going to fire me? And they said, okay, it's it was a big shuffle, and if we have time, I'll go into the different changes in the casting. But they said, okay, it's going to be Al Pacino is going to play Michael. Um, um, and <laughs> is going to play Sonny. And um, you were never a doubt, Bobby. You, you were always 100% agreed upon after the rings in my mind, but also I didn't get any static about you. And uh, Tally uh, will play Connie, <laughs> and uh, um, you know I had sort of felt as long as I'm going to get fired, probably my sister should at least get the chance. <laughs> those are very, those are very. Nice. Like for you to have me when all of that was. No, no. Once, once, once we did it and rehearsed it, then I, I could see that you were working really well. But, but that's you know. Um, um, that's good. I, I'm gonna, uh, Al. I'm saving you for last. Uh, let's go to Diane. Uh, uh, Diane, uh, how did this project come to you? How did you know? I, I honestly, really, I don't know. And, and the strangest thing about it was that you know I, I auditioned, and it seemed to me. Now, maybe I got this wrong, Francis. But it seemed to me I got the part. Before, but I didn't understand why. I still don't. But then I read recently that Francis thought I was eccentric. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it wasn't wrong, but then really, um, it, it was really interesting because it seemed to me like I auditioned with several other potential Michaels. Am I right? I saw you, I saw you, you, you auditioned with a hundred Michaels. Didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, had seen his... you, I had seen you and Richard Castellano in Lovers and Other Strangers. Oh and, uh, That's what I that, mean, yeah. And from that picture, I thought you would be a, a, an well, excellent. you did? Okay, yeah. And, you know, to say you were eccentric, that's not so entirely. But what it was is Kay was written as this New England wasp in the yeah. book and yes. everything. And she was pretty straight. Mm -hmm. And I felt, how could I give her, how could she have the, the interest and, 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 and uh, something beyond being a beautiful 